Hi, this is Kelsey Pukowski for AP Gov, and in Unit 4 we're going to be looking at the presidency. In the last few videos we looked at Congress, and now we're going to be looking specifically at the president, as well as the entire executive branch. So, with respect to presidents, a lot of Americans, of course, just want a president who is powerful and can do many great things from Washington to Jefferson to Lincoln to Roosevelt to Kennedy, amongst other notable presidents. Yet what's really interesting is that Americans are always fearful about a concentration of power, and that is seen since the formation of the Articles of Confederation, because again, Americans tend to be skeptical of authority, whereas in European countries, they tend to be actually more trusting of authority. Now, what is interesting is that within Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution, the most elastic phrase for the president is that the executive power shall be uh, vested in a president of the United States of America, and that is where you get your president. So some of the perks, not going to need to know this, but more of an FYI, salary $400,000 a year. You have perks from an expense account, you have White House staff, you have your vacation spot in Maryland, Camp David, and you also get a pension plan. Uh, the White House is quite a magnificent structure. You don't need to really know anything about uh, 132 rooms in the White House, but more of an FYI, own entertainment from a bowling alley to a putting green and so forth, and also getting to travel, Air Force One, Marine One, and so forth. So there you know it, there you have it. All right, so some of the powers and duties of the president are found in Article 2 of the Constitution, Article 1 being Congress, and Article 3 being the judicial branch. But the president, a.k.a. the executive, is meant to administer the decisions made by the legislature. Constitutionally, powers are limited, but... The power of the presidency has increased steadily since FDR in the 1930s. That is a very important thing to know in terms of a trend, as you see here illustrated by this political cartoon, as if the executive branch has basically cut off the other branches of power. So definitely be aware that the power has increased over time uh, since FDR in the Great Depression, and we've seen the powers in one could easily argue that the president is certainly the most powerful person and also the executive branch is the most powerful branch of the three. All right, let's continue into part two. So the presidents, who they are, typically the formal uh, requirements, or not, I shouldn't say typically, but always the formal requirements. You have to be 35 years of age. And 35 to most people today is not that old, but you got to put it in context that 35 years of age You'd be definitely middle aged, a little bit older than that, especially when life expectancy was much lower during colonial times. You have to be a natural born citizen, and that means being born on U.S. soil or to an American uh, parent. Uh, that is important. And then you also have to have resided in the United States for 14 years, so you couldn't have just, you know, uh, become a naturalized citizen uh, at birth and then lived your entire life in Sweden. You have to be here for at least 14 years. Now, in terms of informal requirements, and again, requirements are put here in quotes that, historically speaking, most presidents have been white, male, Protestants with families. Seldom do you see a non-Protestant, especially one who does not have families. Uh, typically, they come from professional backgrounds, but tend to be more political ones, such as former state governors, uh, for example, or some involved in politics to some extent, or especially law. And here you see, when you look at presidents, they tend to also have some type of military background as well. So you see Republicans and Democrats have sort of gone back and forth uh, over time. So presidents, how they get there? Well, there are uh, a few ways that you can actually get there. You have, of course, the normal road, which is the elections. And that is you are, of course, being indirectly elected through the Electoral College. Very, very important that you know that they are indirectly elected. Remember, each state has a certain number of electors, for example, California having 55. And in December, those 55, amongst the other electors, go to Washington, D.C. and formally cast their ballot for president. Now, once elected, of course, the president serves a term of four years. You cannot exceed two terms, and that is per the 22nd Amendment. A good way to remember that is 2-2, two, two, right? Two terms, 22nd Amendment. And that was passed in 1951, which will officially limit the number of terms to two. Historically speaking, the, the precedent started with Washington, and most presidents tended to heed that advice, although there were a couple, for example, FDR, who exceeded two. And of course, Teddy Roosevelt, interestingly enough, tried to go for that third term, but uh, unfortunately, the Bull Moose Party did not succeed there. 
But most presidents, how they've gotten there, have been through elections, being elected through office. However, thanks to secession, other presidents have made it other ways. So the vice president, of course, secedes the president in the event that the president leaves office due to death. It could be resignation or removal. And in the event of a death, uh, you have the 25th Amendment. And that being said, that the vice president becomes the acting president if the vice president in the president's cabinet determine that the president is disabled or uh, is essentially dead. So the 25th Amendment sort of formalizes that process. And here are some of the presidents with incomplete terms, starting with William Henry Harrison, that stubborn president who did not bundle up enough and gave a very long uh, inaugural, inaugural speech and caught a cold and died of pneumonia. And then all the way to, of course, when McKinley is shot, and then you have Teddy Roosevelt coming in. And probably, actually, the most recent one being after Richard Nixon resigned, was not impeached, resigned, um, and Gerald Ford became president. And then, of course, speaking of impeachment, impeachment is merely an accusation. So to be impeached doesn't mean that you're being removed. It simply means that it's an accusation. Of course, remember the one of the... Uh, exclusive powers to the House is that they have the impeachment power, so they can level an accusation against the president, or it could be a, a federal judge as well, or somebody within the bureaucracy, and it's the Senate's role to hold the trial. Charges may be brought for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Again, not policy dis disagreements, so they can't say something like, you know what, I don't like the president's stance on gun rights, so as a result, we're going to impeach the president. Again, it cannot be based on policy disagreement. Now, if impeached, the president is tried by the Senate with the Chief Justice presiding, and it handles simply like a trial. Two presidents have been impeached, that being Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton, neither of which was convicted. And again, just to reiterate, Richard Nixon was not impeached. He resigned before impeachment or the accusation was leveled before him. Another pertinent amendment is the 20th Amendment. This is known as the Lame Duck Amendment. Essentially what this did was the inauguration for the president used to be in March. This has moved back to January because if you're elected in November, that amount of time between when you're removed from office after you are either served your two terms or you weren't reelected is known as a lame duck period. So to prevent inactivity or hasty decisions on your way out because you think you have nothing to lose, well, this is now prevented as a result of the 20th Amendment, which is again known as the lame duck amendment. All right, we're going to end here for now.